One of the most influential people during the Tudor period was Thomas Cranmer. He was a key leader in the English Reformation, and held the very significant office of Archbishop of Canterbury. This was during the reigns of Henry VIII, Edward VI, and even Mary I. However, it was under Mary in which Cranmer would fall spectacularly from grace because of his work in religion and in politics. His execution has gone down in history as a rather unlawful and horrific event in which the poor archbishop should really have been saved from being burned at the stake. His death made him a martyr in the Protestant faith, and he's seen today as a figure who met his death with courage. Today we look at the brutal execution of Thomas Cranmer, and to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Thomas Cranmer would, during the reign of Henry VIII, become one of the most important figures in Tudor England. Not much is known about his childhood, however he went to Jesus College in Cambridge to study for eight years. He would marry a lady called Joan, who worked at a local inn, and because of this he was forced to abandon his fellowship, but upon her death in childbirth, he returned to Cambridge to study. Cranmer took holy orders in 1520, and he was named one of the preachers who was entitled to a papal grant to license for preaching throughout England. During this time at university, he was entirely loyal to Catholicism and the Pope, and even attacked the reformative ideas of Martin Luther, describing him as a most wicked man. Around the year 1527, he gained a reputation as a distinguished scholar, and he was involved with helping Henry VIII get his first marriage with Catherine of Aragon annulled, and it was he who suggested to Bishop Edward Fox and Bishop Stephen Gardiner that they should get the opinions of scholars and theorists from universities, rather than relying upon the judgement of Rome and the Catholic Church. The King looked favourably at this plan, as it meant he was more likely to get what he wanted, and Cranmer was appointed to be part of this team, to gather the opinions, and they would conclude that Henry VIII was able to exercise supreme judgement or jurisdiction within his realm of England, and that he was able to annul his marriage with Catherine without Rome's consent. The university also decreed that Henry's marriage to his brother's widow was illegal and against divine law, but eventually the king got his wish. Cranmer following this would become the ambassador to the court of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and he would learn about the Reformation and see the effects of this in cities across Europe. In autumn 1532, he would receive a letter informing him that he had been selected as the new Archbishop of Canterbury and he was ordered home to take up his new position, being consecrated on the 30th of March 1533. Here he would work hard with Henry sorting out the final parts of his annulment, which was done discreetly, as Anne Boleyn, Henry's soon to be second wife, was now pregnant, so a secret marriage ceremony was held in January 1533, even before the annulment had been finalised. It would be Cranmer as Archbishop who would finally rule that the marriage between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon was against the will of God, and he in late May declared the marriage of Catherine and Anne Boleyn as valid, with Anne being crowned Queen of England shortly after. Cranmer also had the pleasure of baptising the couple's daughter, the future Elizabeth I, and was named her godfather. He had become part of the king's inner circle, however could do little to prevent Anne Boleyn's downfall when the king's eye went wandering after he grew increasingly frustrated with the queen's failure to provide him with the male heir he wanted. Cranmer would oversee proceedings and acted as a judge at Lambert Palace to try Henry's petition to divorce Anne Boleyn. He had to find a reason for reversing his decision and to declare Anne and Henry's marriage invalid. Anne Boleyn eventually met a grisly end, being beheaded after being accused of incest, treason and adultery, with many male members of the royal court. Cranmer then spent a great deal of time focusing his efforts on religious reforms, for example adopting the English translation of the Bible, worked upon by Miles Coverdale, John Rogers and William Tyndale. He was doing rather well in his position under Henry VIII, however when he would learn of the King's fifth wife Catherine Howard's previous life and possible extramarital affairs, he was chosen to tell the King of this. He chose to tell the King by giving him a letter during a religious service and acting upon Cranmer's word, the fifth wife would also be executed like Anne Boleyn. Thomas Cranmer did survive a plot to destabilise his position in 1543, however would end up with the King's full support. Cranmer was arrested in November, but being fully backed by the King, two of the ringleaders of the plot were sent to prison, with one being Stephen Gardiner's nephew. Whilst Henry VIII was dying, 
Thomas Cranmer was there by his bedside, and he held his hand and gave the king a reformed statement of faith, instead of his usual last rites, which would be read before death. Cranmer showed immense grief for his master, and for the king, by growing a beard which was a statement of rejection against the old church. Under Edward VI, Thomas Cranmer was one of the executors of Henry's will, and was an important member of the Lord Protector's administration, helping the young king to run the country and continue with the Reformation. The 1549 Act of Uniformity was established and this brought in the Book of Common Prayer, which set out the new legal forms of worship in England, and as it was made compulsory, there was mass rebellion and revolts in England, and a call for a return to the old ways. The rebellion against the prayer book was squashed, but it did have a negative effect on the protectorate, but Cranmer went on to publish more religious decrees and doctrines. Upon Edward VI's death, Cranmer performed the funeral, giving the young Protestant king his funeral rites. It was a time in which now many members of the reformed clergy fled England, as Mary I was in control, following her defeat of Lady Jane Grey's rebellion. This was incredibly dangerous for Thomas Cranmer, as Mary was a Catholic, and all of Thomas Cranmer's work had been focused around since becoming Archbishop, was to bring about Protestantism, and seemingly shun Catholicism in England. Cranmer would declare that all the doctrine and religion by our said Sovereign Lord King Edward VI is more pure and according to God's word. Because of this statement, he was forced to stand before the Queen's Council, and was then sent to the Tower of London, before being transferred to the Ricardo Prison in Oxford. So many Protestants were arrested, that Cranmer was forced to share his apartment with other leading figures, such as Bishops Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, whose execution he would later be forced to watch. Cranmer was stripped of his church offices, and he was placed on trial for heresy on the 12th of September 1555. Ridley and Latimer, his cellmates, were found guilty immediately, and were burned at the stake, but Cranmer had to wait on the final verdict from Rome about his guilt. On the 4th of December, he had lost the post of Archbishop, and permission was given to the secular authorities to decide Cranmer's sentence. Between the end of January 1556 and February, Cranmer would make four recantations, apologising for his faith and his actions and submitting himself to the authority of Mary. He also recognised the Pope as the head of the church. His execution had already been set for the 7th of March 1556. He had recanted and returned to the Catholic Church, which usually should have resulted in him being absolved of his actions, but it only merely postponed his execution. He would make a further rebuttal, however his final execution date was set for the 21st of March 1556. On the day of his execution, he was taken to University Church in Oxford to offer a final recantation in public during a service. He wrote and submitted a speech in advance, and at the pulpit he opened with a prayer and remarked to obey the king and queen, however at the end of his sermon he deviated from the script. He renounced his recantations, saying that this hand which he signed them would be punished by being burned first. He was then wrestled from the pulpit and taken to the same place in which Latimer and Ridley had been burned previously. Cranmer's execution was very unlawful, because before he was executed, he had recanted a number of different times. Although he denounced this before his death, he accepted the Catholic faith, but there's a few reasons why Mary I refused to accept Cranmer's apology and commute his death sentence. Firstly, it could have been down to revenge, as Cranmer was the one who annulled Mary's parents' marriage and allowed her father to marry Anne Boleyn. Mary and her mother, Catherine of Aragon, had been treated harshly by the king following this. Also, Mary could have seen it as her job to punish one of the men who was mostly responsible for the English Reformation, and she could have seen herself as doing God's work in getting rid of someone who she thought was a heretic. Mary could have also been motivated by politics, as Cranmer was incredibly influential, and it could have been too dangerous to leave him alive. An eyewitness account of Archbishop Thomas Cranmer's death tells us the complete barbaric story of his death by being burned at the stake. It reads, Coming to the stake with a cheerful countenance and willing mind, he put off his garments with haste and stood upright in his shirt. A Bachelor of Divinity laboured to convert him to his former recantation with the two Spanish friars, and when the friars saw his constantly, they said in Latin to one another, Let us go from him, we ought not to nigh him, 
for the devil is with him. But the bachelor of divinity was more earnest with him, and to whom he answered, that as concerning his recantation, he repented it right sore, because he knew it was against the truth. The bachelor of divinity then refused to take him by the hand, and blamed all the others that so did, and said he was sorry that he ever came in his company, and yet again, he required him to agree to his former recantation. And the bishop answered showing his hand, this was the hand that wrote it, and therefore shall it suffer first punishment. What this means is that even before the fire would engulf Cranmer, the Catholic officials are still trying to get him to recant and become a Catholic, but Cranmer would stand firm at the end, and the Catholics refused to then help him. The account then says, fire being now put to him, he stretched out his right hand and thrust it into the flame, and held it there for a good space, before the fire came to any other part of his body, where his hand was seen of every man sensibly burning, crying, with a loud voice. This hand hath offended. As soon as the fire got up, he was very soon dead, never stirring or crying all the while. His patience in the torment, his courage in dying. His dying words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I see the heavens open, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Thomas Cranmer would become one of the most influential politicians throughout the reigns of Henry VIII and Edward VI. However, the religious shift that Mary I brought to England spelled the downfall and fall from grace for the Archbishop. His death, as mentioned, was unlawful, and it was a clear power play by Bloody Mary to execute him, and it spelled a clear deterrent to those Protestants to recant and revert back to Catholicism. His decision to withdraw his recantations really did spell the end for the Archbishop, who it was assumed had made his own mind up on the 21st of March 1556 that he was to die with dignity, and that it would be his last day on earth. He is remembered as a key statesman, a hugely influential figure in Protestantism, and as a man who stood up to Mary I, but ultimately paid the horrific price. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.